All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, so where we last, oh, before I do that, uh, so you should have uh, the reading done by now, and uh, project one uh, is due on the 16th, which is Monday uh, at the usual time. Uh, question. Says the 17th? Maybe that's my typo. I'll clarify that um, after the class is over. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? So when you do the stick breaking construction, please do it yourself. Don't just copy the code that's on there and just regurgitate it back. That's not the point of the exercise. The point is for you to be able to do this uh, yourself because we will absolutely use this uh, in more sophisticated projects uh, later on in the semester. Okay, so where we left off, uh, we talked about reliability, and we developed uh, this, uh, the sample spaces for each of them to kind of clean up the expressions a little bit. Uh, we had the sample sp space for the disk, uh, which included two events, uh, the crash event and the run event uh, for the hard drive, C sub H and R sub H. We had the first backup and the second backup, for each of which we described uh, the crash event, uh, C1 and R1 and the run event. And likewise, uh, for the second backup, we define the, uh, the sample space omega for the second backup um, consisting of the crash event and the run event. And so uh, we were given the probability of crash for the hard disk, which was 1%, the probability of crash C1 uh, for the first backup, which was 2%, and the probability of crash uh, for the second uh, back, uh, backup, which was also 2%. So using the law of total probability, uh, we said what is the event, uh, the probability associated, associated with the event uh, of running. Uh, and so we use the fact that law of total probability says the probability uh, of everything or anything that can happen. So the probability of omega is one. We subtract from that uh, the probability of the crash events respectively. And we get uh, from that the probability of the run events. So uh, doing so, we got the probability of the hard drive running R sub H is 99% or 0.99. And likewise, uh, the probability of uh, the first backup running is 98%, as well as 98% uh, for the probability that the second backup also runs. And so uh, then this is from the book. Uh, and the book asks, what is the probability that information is saved? Now, you could certainly uh, compute that directly. And we'll do that today and show you that we arrive upon the same result as doing it the way uh, that's a little bit uh, easier uh, to calculate. And this just speaks to the fact that sometimes when you're solving problems uh, in probability or using probabilities, if you find that some expression is more difficult, it has a lot of terms, a lot of moving parts, as I like to call it, um, sometimes it's a lot easier uh, to solve uh, the opposite, right? So. The idea of probability uh, of information being saved is the same as saying not lost. And so doing it that way, so the, the probability of save, P, that information is saved, is equal to 1 minus the probability that information is lost. You can compose uh, a universe of consideration, a, a, a sample space, if you will, uh, that consists of two events that the system itself, and, li and mind you, when I say the system, that system is comprised of the hard drive and the two backups. So if the system can save information, the system can also not save information. So we're using that fact and the law of total probability to set up this expression that P saved is 1 minus P lost. And so in doing so, we're um, guessing or hoping uh, that computing the probability that information is lost is a lot easier than directly computing the probability that information is saved. Okay, so that's where we left off last time. Any questions about this? <clears throat> okay, so continuing on, what we did for the probability that information is lost, well, each of these disks operates independently. So the run state of one does not impact the run state of the other. And we discussed uh, last time that when you have so-called independent events, if you want the probability of the anding of these events, that's the same as the product of the individual probabilities of the singleton or singular uh, event probabilities. So we have the probability that information is lost. In order to lose information, the hard drive has to fail. Okay. Likewise, backup one has to fail, and the second backup also has to fail. So the primary and your two spares all have to fail in order to lose information. So we set up the expression 
probability of lost is the probability of all these three events that the disk crashed, backup one crashed, and at the same time, backup two crashes. Okay. So we substitute in for this expression uh, the events that we uh, created for the sigma algebras associated with the run slash crash state of each of our respective components, the three drives, the hard drive, backup one, and backup two. So we substitute in the probability that the hard drive crashes, C sub H, and that with the probability that the first backup crashes, C1, and, and that with the probability, uh, rather with the event, that the second backup crashes, C2. Going by the rule of independent events, we now take the individual probabilities and we multiply them together. So that's P of uh, CH times probability of C1 times the probability of C2. Now, of course, we're given what those probabilities are from the definition of the problem. Uh, the probability uh, that CH occurs is 1%, C2 occurs is 2%, C, um, rather C1 occurs is 2%, and C2 occurring is another 2%. So we're just going to substitute in for these probabilities. We're going to multiply to get the probability uh, that information is lost, and then we're going to subtract that result from 1. Okay? Um, any questions? Make sense? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So we have 1 minus 0 0.01 times 0 0.02 times 0 0.02. So we compute that product and we subtract it from 1. And we get 0 0.99999, so 9 repeating 5 times, and 6. Uh, that's the same as, um, as being 999,996, right? Uh, so we get that value and we subtract 1 or rather, we multiply our three probabilities together and we subtract it from one, and we get the probability that information uh, is saved, right? So here's our product here. That's information being lost. One minus that product is the probability of information saved. So information is saved 999,996 times out of a million. So thinking about what that means, to get to a million, we need, uh, we need another... 0.000004 to add to that 6 to make uh, our 1.0. So that means that given this setup and these numbers, this thing is going to crash or not save four times every 1 million times that you run it. So four out of 1 million, which is pretty good, right? Uh, now, certainly over the lifespan of a disk, is that going to get worse? Well, we're not taking into consideration uh, the status of the magnetic material on the disk, if it's a magnetic drive, or the chips, uh, if it's an SSD. But just purely from these numbers, uh, that's pretty good. And so what you'll see from a redundant system uh, uh, standpoint, that if you increase the redundancy at a, sec a third backup, and a fourth backup, and a fifth backup, you'll see that this number gets closer and closer and closer to one, right? Okay. Any questions about this? So what we'll do is we'll do this the quote-unquote long way, right, the harder way, and show you that we arrive upon the same number. Okay. So let's take a look at this idea of relationships. Now, you're going to see diagrams like this in the book, and, you know, depicted here up in the slide. It's more colorful in the slide. So let's kind of relate these diagrams, because the book doesn't cover this, uh, to uh, probabilities in general. So we have a, something called a trial, and a trial, like we said, is the action that occurs, and you make some observation. So the event that occurs depends on some experiment, right? And that's our dependency. And we have our event. And that event, when you make an observation, has many possibilities. Something occurs some percentage of the time. And output from that event is something that you see. That's what you measure. And so in this diagram, in these types of diagrams, the arrow connotes a dependency, right? So the event that's going to occur depends on the experiment you're performing. Now, that might seem like uh, pretty obvious, right? So if you press the button on your camera, you get an event which consists of uh, observations, so you observe that event, and that's the pixel array that you get from your camera, right? You don't press the button on your digital camera or your cell phone, and all of a sudden the toilet flushes. That'd be weird. Right? Is it possible? Yeah, but in most cases, um, it doesn't usually happen. So this arrow connotes uh, dependency. So let's think about now when we you know, originally looked at 
the picture of the internals of an iPhone, iPhone, I think it's sixth uh, generation, we saw a bunch of components and these components interact with one another. Absolutely, they operate independently. When I say independently, just the sheer fact that one crashes, it doesn't cause another to crash. But there are other components that interact with it. Um, there's information from that component that influences something else. So the power management, for example, is going to influence your signal strength because that's going to either boost the power to your antenna or decrease the power to your antenna. So while they operate independently, run independently, and they fail independently, they still have some relationship to one another because they interact with one another. And so you can take uh, these graphs, uh, these so-called stock and flow or flow diagrams, and you can use them to describe or depict or model, if you will, the relationship between individual components where each component corresponds to one of these left to right uh, assemblies, right? So you have a trial, you have an event, that's the circle, and then you have the output or observation from that event, and that observation is associated with some uh, probability. So in this particular case, when you think about the question, the probability that information is saved, when you look at these drives, they operate independently. So the hard drive, if it crashes, it doesn't Im impact the run state of the first backup, and it doesn't impact the run state of the second backup. So if you look at these individual uh, components, let's say the first component was the hard drive, I'll call that H, and then B1, the first backup, and then B2, the second backup. Now when you read this graph, you will notice that you have a starting place, and then the left to right path that you traverse, you can traverse the path corresponding uh, to the observation uh, for the hard drive, you can traverse the path separately for the first backup, and likewise, you can traverse the path uh, for, the sec for, the, for the first backup and also for the second backup. So this is a so-called parallel configuration, and it's exactly, in electrical engineering, what you'd call a parallel circuit, right? You have these lines parallel to one another, right? So this one is parallel to this one, parallel to this one. And so when you have this arrangement, it says that these three things, they do not interact with one another, right? Uh, a parallel configuration. So there's no dependence there, and we'll talk about uh, the sequential in a few slides. So when we have that, let's say they all crash. If these drives do not influence one another, so they don't need information from the other drive, for the sake of example, let's say they all crash. For information to not be saved because they don't influence one another, they don't depend on one another, uh, we draw this diagram, and then for the case of information not being saved, we'd have to have the following observations. For the hard drive, we had a crash. For backup one, we have a crash. And likewise, uh, for backup three, we'd have to have a crash. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? So um, this is a simplification, but you can imagine uh, for something like a communication satellite or uh, for something like an iPhone, uh, such a diagram would be much more complex. You could have down at the comp individual component level, or you could have more at the system or board level, uh, such diagrams. Okay, so this is sometimes, you know, well, this is a version of a larger um, discipline or a larger field called operations research, and this is sometimes called a stock and flow diagram. Uh, this in particular is a probabilistic stock flow diagram. And in organizations, um, in operations research, they study uh, how operations, uh, be that a business or a system, how they work, and they analyze things like when they work well, if there are failure states, uh, what is the time to service for some final output given an initial input. And so there are a lot of people that really care a lot about this stuff, and uh, probabilistic stock flow diagrams uh, are used uh, to do reliability analysis when you have a bunch of components that interact with one another. Okay, And so you notice the events that are in omega disk, omega backup one, and omega backup two, they don't depend on one another because if you trace the left to right path from start to finish for the stock and flow diagram, you'll notice that you go through one at a time uh, on the top path, the middle path, or the bottom path, uh, but the input, the output of one component doesn't affect the input of another component. Okay, make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, because we will have a homework. Uh, for you to find equivalencies. And so these parallel paths 
uh, in the stock flow diagram capture uh, the fact that these do not depend on one another. Okay. So let's say we were going to ask that question again. We got that 0.999 repeating five times followed by six, right? 999,996 out of a million. Uh, and that's what we got doing that approach of probability of save is the probability of one minus the probability that data is lost. So let's do this the long way, right? Um, you know, you might call it the straightforward way because intuitively, you know, using positive logic, you think, okay, probability of save. Okay, it means what? It means that at least one of these run. So nomenclature-wise, we'd have the union of all of these run events occurring, right? So we have this relationship, this parallel relationship uh, in our probabilistic stock flow diagram. And then we have the event we're interested in is the probability of the hard drive running or backup one running or backup two running. Now, at least one of them has to run for information to be saved. Now, of course, let's say for the sake of argument, if we had no idea if these events, RH, R1, and R2, if they overlapped or not. And we talked about this idea of a three-way uh, union uh, between events that could possibly overlap with one another. And we had the term we introduced called the principle of inclusion-exclusion, where we had the Venn diagram between three events, A, B, and C. So just unpacking the principle of exclusion, inclusion, exclusion, right? We are going to compute this probability of this union, P of RH union R1 union R2, to be the sum of the individual probabilities, P of RH, R1, and R2. And then we're going to do that fix up by subtracting out the two-way intersections. And then we're going to do another fix up by adding back the three-way intersection. This is in a direct application of the principle of inclusion exclusion when we had that diagram from before where we had three events a b and c where that was a that was i think it was c and that was b right it's the same deal it's a direct application uh, of that same example only the events now are r h r1 and r2 instead of uh, a b and c okay any questions about this all right so now, what we're going to do, we're, we're just going to plain plug in to these probabilities using the definitions that we started with and that fact uh, about the law of total probability. Okay, so of course, this is a lot to compute, right? So if you're given a question like this, you could compute it directly and that would be absolutely correct. There's nothing mathematically wrong, but you have a lot of terms here. And whenever you have a lot of moving parts in some formula, there are more opportunities to make a mistake, to get it wrong, right? So you always look for ways that you can write things that are equivalent mathematically, but they have fewer moving parts. You want to simplify. And I often say mathematicians are some of the most wonderfully lazy people around, right? They want things to be smaller. They want things to be simpler. But you just have to recognize when to apply those rules. And as long as it's mathematically equivalent, um, it's fair game, okay? All right, so this is a lot of moving parts, and before, instead of doing it directly this way, uh, we computed the probability of information loss, and we just subtracted that uh, from one to get the same expression, but this is absolutely the direct expression for the probability of information being saved. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite that. Any questions before we continue? No? No questions? All right. So let's just plug in. So let's recall the probability that the hard drive crashed was 1%, and therefore the probability of the hard drive running, R sub H, is 99%. Likewise, the probability of backup one crashing was 2%. That was given to us. So by law of total probability, the probability of backup one running is 1 minus that 2%, which is 98%. Uh, same thing for the second backup. Uh, by law of total probability, through the use of that, the probability of the second backup running is 98% or 0.98. So we're just going to plug in. So here we have our 99% for the running of the hard drive, 98% and 98% for backup one and two. So then the two-way intersection here, probability of RH and R1, right? Uh, again, these run independently. They crash independently. So we're going to make use of that rule that says 
the product of the anding of two events that are independent is just the product of the individuals. So here we see the product of probability of run with the product of probability of run for hard drive and the first backup. Okay. So we're going to do the same thing with the two-way intersection between RH and R2 and the two-way intersection between R1 and R2. So here we have 99.99 times 0.98. And then here we have 0.98 times 0.98 for that last two-way intersection, the probability of uh, the first backup running ended with the second backup running. Okay, so lastly, we'll take a look at this three-way intersection. This is the probability, we're adding that, uh, probability of RH ended with R1 and R2. Again, we make advantage or take advantage or make use uh, of that rule that says the probability of the ending of independent events is just the product of the individual probabilities. And so we do that. Probability of RH is 0.99. Probability of R1 is 0.98. Probability of R2 is 0.98. And so we have that product. So we have a bunch of terms. We have an addition here of three terms on top. We have the subtraction of the two-way intersections here. And then we have the addition of the three-way intersection. Okay, I did the math ahead of time, and uh, this is what we get. We get the same expression, 9.999 repeating five times followed by six. It's the exact same expression as if we computed one minus the probability that information is lost. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? That makes sense? So this method is the direct method, and what we talked about a few slides ago is an indirect method by just using facts about probability, okay? And each one is equally valid. The first way, this indirect method, by looking at the not or the dual uh, or the inverse, if you will, uh, is a lot easier because you have fewer terms, whereas, oops, whereas the direct method it's mathematically correct, and there's no nothing wrong with doing it the direct method, but it has more terms that you have to deal with. Okay? All right. Uh, but it is the same answer. Questions? No questions? That makes sense? So we're using our rules. We're making substitutions, and we've shown how we can evaluate this reliability two different ways, uh, and we use the probabilistic stock flow diagram to depict the relationship, the dependence between these. Now, when I say dependence, I don't mean the run dependence. I mean, does one use information from another, right? The system interaction. Okay, so here's a sequential dependence. Uh, and this is a so-called sequential circuit. And you can see in the left to right order uh, along the pathway for this probabilistic stock flow diagram, we start and then we might run a disk. And that disk can either run or crash, and the output of that disk is used for something else, right? Uh, the input of another. And so one hard example, real life example of this is imagine if your first disk held a table of contents, a file table, and each entry in that first disk told you where on the second disk you find each file, right? So imagine if someone, you know, you have a big book, textbook, and you have a table of contents that tells you where all of the different chapters and sections start. Imagine if someone just tore that out and destroyed it, right? It's still usable, but it's not meaningful because you have no idea where to find this information. That's particularly bad if you're dealing with a file system. So in this particular case, the sequential dependency says that the output of one component influences or defines the input of another component. So there's a dependence there. So let's say you know we want to know for uh, this dependent uh, system, for this uh, sequential dependence uh, version of a system, we have a table of contents on the first drive. And that table of contents is used uh, to describe where on the second drive you find your files. So that is absolutely a sequential dependence. So we model it with the sequential stock flow uh, diagram. So in order for information for the system to be saved, well, we need the hard drive to run because that has our table of contents. And then likewise, at the same time, so and, we need the disk R1, the backup one to run, right? And I'm calling it backup 
uh, but in this case, it's a data drive and the hard drive is a uh, table of contents. Okay. So in that case, we'd express the probability of information being saved. And you'll notice it's different from when we showed the parallel circuit uh, before, right? Uh, in this case, the probability of information saved means that our table of contents drive has to run, right? Uh, it can't crash. And at the same time, our data drive, R1, it has to run. So we have the probability of RH and R1. And uh, because these uh, drives run and crash on their own, right, even though you have information from one that's used for another, you're going to multiply their individual probabilities. Okay, and that result uh, is going to be uh, your probability that information is saved. Now you notice it's different in this case uh, from before if you did out the numbers. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right. So in the book, uh, there's a so called mixed circuit. And uh, the problem asked, and something like this is going to be on the homework, so if you want to get ahead on it, I would look at it. Um, and here we have a sequential uh, dependence between component A and B. And here they're just labeling these components with uh, their events. So you have a run state and a crash state associated with each component. That's sequential between A and B. D and E, that's in parallel, right? So that's parallel. So now, if you want the probability of run and crash of this section, AB, you can actually compute that by computing the probability of run and crash for the equivalent of this um, serial connection, right? That would just be this expression. So you'd compute, uh, you know, run and run for A and run for B, and that resulting probability uh, would be the probability of the entire system that consists of the sequential connection between A and B. Likewise, for D and E, uh, you'd find an equivalent uh, crash and run rate based on the individual probabilities uh, by doing something similar to what we saw here with the parallel dependence, right? So at each step along the way, you're finding equivalencies, right, for that subsection, bless you. And then once you find that equivalent, this A and B, let's say you're going to call that F, right? So something called F looks like the result of combining or finding the equivalent run, uh, run crash rate uh, of this sequential, the sequential uh, subsection. Then you do the same thing for D and E, and then maybe you might rename that to be component G. And then now you see that component G is in series with this component C. So now you apply it again, this series dependence. You find that probability, and then maybe you call that result H. And then you'll see that component F and component H are in parallel. And then you do that parallel dependence. Um, you run that, and then you end up with an equivalent result for the entire system for its run rate or crash rate. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay. Um, so we're going to have uh, a homework uh, coming out after the project, probably out on Tuesday. Uh, that's going to um, have you exercise uh, probably the same one from the book. Okay. All right. No questions? Okay. So we'll finish that module. Bless you. And we'll start the next uh, segment which uh, will hopefully start counting. Okay, Dropbox. Hopefully it doesn't make me reload. I think it might. That was three. Four. There we go. Make sure it's the right one. Yes, it is. Okay. So let's pick back up with our next uh, module. So um, the reading uh, for this uh, by Thursday um, is going to be six pages, section 2.3 in the book. You should already be done with the previous reading. And of course, again, project one is due. I'll make sure I, I'm, I have the date right, 16th or 17th. I'll, Make sure that I probably said 17th to give you a class lecture before it's due. 
I can't remember. I'll look at the homework. I, I believe you, 17th. I just have to make sure the date is consistent with the uh, what's printed on the, the PDF. Okay, so we just talked about that. Um, I assume that we we're going to do this at the beginning of a class. So let me skip uh, past the refresh your memory stuff. Uh, so we did a bunch of stuff so far. We talked about set operations. Uh, we talk about stock flow diagrams. We look at MATLAB. Uh, we did the stick breaking construction uh, to show you how to implement biased sampling. Uh, we talked about the sequential circuit. We talked about the parallel circuit and reliability. And we talked about probabilities of combined uh, sets of events. So, you know, already um, it's been, what, end of today will make three weeks which means 16 weeks left to go. Uh, we're continuing to build up machinery uh, so we can start to do uh, the really fun stuff. And so let's go back and on this jar your memory about uh, sigma algebras. And this should be a little bit more familiar now versus uh, the very first module we did on the first day of class. And so we said a sigma algebra is a collection of events. And these events uh, can be drawn uh, from uh, the power set over all the things that you can observe. And so you might wonder, you know, there are these properties about the event as in the sigma algebra as well as its complement, as well as uh, a countable uh, subset. Uh, you also have the union of all those. It's your way of building up complex events uh, from simple events. And so we have this construct and, you know, we talked about uh, simple examples and now we're gonna kind of get to how to figure out some heuristics or recipes, if you will, uh, to figure out the number of events or count uh, events uh, that are in a more complex event. So, of course, we said how many uh, events are in a single coin flip, right? And you said what? What did you say? How many events in a coin flip? How many? Two. Two events. Okay. All right. And then we talked about something more complex. We said, let's say if you have n rolls of a die, how many events are in n rolls of a die? N rolls? Is it six in N rolls? That's one roll. What about six rolls? Six is in there, yeah. Six to, pardon? Six to the N. Six to the N. Because each of those N many times, uh, you have six choices. All right, great. So you can kind of almost visualize that. Think of that just off the top of your head. Wonderful. So let's make it a little more complicated, right? Let's think about it. We're not going to do it now, but after I'm done with the module, you'll be able to do that, do this. So you need cardinality in still, right? Just like you had the die roll and the coin flip, you still need cardinality to talk about complex events in order to describe them. But there's a problem now because these events are, are a lot harder to figure out off the top of your head. So we need some heuristics or recipes. So let, one question you might ask, how many football teams can you form um, from DSU students and the team has to have six females and five males and let's say you're doing this in the fall of 2018, right? Well, certainly there are some numbers that are given. In fall of 2018, you had a total student population of 4872 and the ratio or proportions of 60% female, 40% male. You could apply that to actually calculate it. If you have a fractional person, you just round up or round down whatever you choose. And, you know, a little bit more information. You have a field and you have 10 players on the field plus one goalie, right? And then you also have five substitutes. How many events, and let's say the event you observe is the selection of players comprising your team? How many different teams can you form, right? That would be our sample space omega. That's a lot harder to think about, right? So let's think about how you might devise some strategies or some strategies uh, to be able to enumerate or count uh, more complex events like this. So, of course, it's not always straightforward to see the possible events, right? Now, something like a die roll or coin flip, uh, that's more straightforward. Everyone sort of has an intuitive feel for how you might do that, how you might count those elements in uh, the sigma algebra, um, rather in the um, sample space. And so the study of counting things, whether events, objects, numbers, is called combinatorics, right? You should have, hopefully, did you do that in discrete math? Any combinatorics? No? Okay, so combinatorics is a branch, sub-branch of discrete math uh, that deals with how you count things. How do you enumerate them? So, of course, 
To count means to put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the naturals. So you can count things that are finite, meaning they end, or you can count things that are infinite, meaning they're ongoing. Now, different ways you count, or the reason you count, is because you presume that you have some order for the objects that you want to enumerate or put in one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, you might do them or order them in something called non-increasing order or non-decreasing order. Now, you might think, gosh, well, why is he saying non-increasing, right? It gets smaller when you have non-increasing order. It does not increase. But the reason why I don't say order getting smaller, so let's say, you know, uh, 10, 7, 3, 1. That's non-increasing order. They're getting smaller. But the reason why they say non-increasing instead of decreasing is because in non-increasing, you can have repetitions, right? Decrease means to get smaller. Non-increasing means it can never get bigger, right? Those two are very different. So let's say you had a string of numbers, 10, 8, 8, 3, 1. That's non-increasing order. That's a different from decreasing order. So that's why mathematically you see that description, right? Uh, likewise, you have non-decreasing order. That means things are getting bigger, or they can be the same as you go through this list. You also have different ordering called lexicographic. That means in terms of alphanumeric, when you sort them, right? Both in terms of their alphabetic order as well as numerical order. The numbers come before the letters in the alphabet. And then you also have relative ordering, and that might be with respect to some starting point or some origin. Right. Uh, so, for example, if you want to say what's closest to DSU, you take the center of DSU and then you order things based on their radial distance from DSU and you can actually put them in a list based on that. So there are different ways you order things and we want to order them using this counting mechanism and we put counts on events in the sigma algebra uh, comprised of sample space. So um, there's a video on counting. I was going to play it, but um, I'm in a copyright dispute right now, so um, I don't think I'll play that. I'll just refrain from that for now, but I can post the URL and repost the slides. So let's take a look at counting. Okay, so suppose we have equally likely outcomes, right? Just like the die roll, uh, just like picking a card from a deck. You have equally likely outcomes, so you define your sample space, okay, list out all the possible events, and let's say you can have n possible outcomes. So here, we might write something like our, our sample space omega consists of little omega 1, little omega 2, and you have n many possible events. For the die roll, n would be 6. For the coin flip, uh, n would be 2. So you have each of these n possible outcomes, and they're what's called collectively exhaustive, meaning that all of these little omegas, these w's, w's if you want to call it that, uh, comprise our entire universe of all possibilities. So what that means is that if you added the individual prob probabilities of each of these events, uh, that would be the probability of our sample space omega, which is one. Okay, so this node is just a sidebar that sometimes uh, nomenclature-wise, you might just write the sum and just say um, probability of w of omega k is equal to 1. So sometimes they drop the index here on the summation, right? So I just want to make you aware of different ways of saying the same thing, because depending on where someone went to school, what philosophy they learned, they might use slightly different notation uh, to say the same thing. And it's important for you uh, to get comfortable with the different ways of saying the same thing. So if you go off and look up something online or in the library, you're going to see different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, any questions so far? Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay. All right, so in this particular case, if you have a bunch of equally likely outcomes, and there are n many of them, the probability, just by definition of law of total probability, is equal to 1 over n. The probability of each one is equal to 1 over n. Well, okay, that's pretty straightforward. And what this means, uh, is that no event is preferred over the other. So that's pretty straightforward to enumerate, count, and start thinking about probabilities uh, for events in that case. Okay, so the simplest uh, type of outcome uh, concerns our equally likely events. And let's say we have some complex event, E, and that complex event is formed uh, by taking the union of T many 
of those simple events, right? That goes back to the definition of a sigma algebra, right? We have a finite uh, union of events, right? A countable union of events. Here, we have the first event, second event, the teeth event, and our complex event E is formed by taking the union among those simple events. Okay, so in that particular case, the probability of E is the sum, and we assume that they're non-overlapping. Uh, the probability of E is just the sum of the individual probabilities for those events in E, and we add because they're equiprobable, meaning each one's equally likely, we add those individual probabilities together. So in this case, we have T of these events, omega, that are union together to form our complex event E. So for each one, it's 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 over n, T many times. So that's just T times 1 over n or T over n. Okay. So more generally, and the book talks about it this way, when you talk about the probability of events, they often talk about favorable over possible, right? The favorable events are those events, and you count them, uh, that you are looking for. That's what you favor. And then the denominator possible is the number of events in the whole, uh, in the whole sample space, okay? All right. Any questions about this? Make sense? So favorable over possible. Uh, is how you mechanically compute this. But you're still looking at the count of events that collectively make up this complex event. Okay, so the number of outcomes in E, right, uh, uh, divided by the number of outcomes in our sample space omega. Okay, so let's take another example uh, from a die roll, roll of a single die. And what if we wanted the probability, or we're trying to think of the event, associated with rolling a die and getting an odd number of dots uh, to face up, okay? So this is our sample space omega, and we're kind of going over this. Message, oh, Dr. Olin says one, three, five. Okay, just move on. But I want to make sure that you understand the process with something that's easy to visualize, uh, because when we get to something that's hard to visualize, you want to still exercise the same process, okay? So uh, the sample space omega for the die, omega die, is one, two, three, four, five, six. Each one of these is an event corresponding to the number of dots that are facing up when the die comes to rest. Okay, so let's define uh, sample space, uh, the sigma algebra for the die, right? Now, I didn't have that special English calligraphy font at the time, so when I made this, so I just wrote M, right? But that's supposed to be our sigma algebra. So sigma algebra for the system is going to be the power set. I'm going to make the dense sigma algebra, the power set over omega die. Okay. So if I were to write that out, well, what does that sigma algebra look like? It has the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the singletons. It has the pairs, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, and so forth. It has the triples, 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6, and all the other triples. It has the four-way, and it has omega, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, wait a minute. Lo and behold, look at that. There's 1, 3, 5, right? There's the event corresponding uh, to the odd number of dots. So I can absolutely define a probability over that. It exists. Okay, wonderful. So let's go ahead and write the probability of having an odd. Which event do I use? Well, I know what an odd number is, and I pick out from my sigma algebra uh, that particular event that describes odd, because I know what odd means, and I just write omega odd, right? That's my event. So my event omega odd is that 1, 3, 5, right? And I know it's there because it exists in this uh, sigma algebra. And now I know from the die that each of these outcomes is equally probable, right? Okay, because that's just what a die, how it works. Unless you, you know, put some lead in there and load one of the things and bias it. But let's just assume everything's on the up and up. So we have probability of 1, 3, 5. And we know the probability of each one of these is 1 sixth. So that would be 1 sixth plus 1 sixth plus 1 sixth, right? Three many times. 3 over 6 is 3 times, or 3 of those would be 3 times 1 sixth, which is 1 half, which is 0.5. Okay? So we'll just run through an example of this equally likely outcomes. You have to know what that complex event is, and you can count the number of individual events uh, that make up that. Uh, complex event, 
and now you can uh, go ahead and compute uh, the probable over favorable uh, just by adding together the individual probabilities. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so let's take a look at permutation and combination. Now, when you're picking groups of things, it gets a little bit more complex uh, to organize and count and figure out how many events you have when the idea is that the observable you have is how many ways you can pick something. And so in particular, what you're enterprising to do is how do you compute the number of uh, favorables and the number of uh, total, the total in favor. I changed the notation here. NT and NF. The NT is the number of total. That's the size of your sample space. And favorable NF is the number of things that you desire, right? Uh, in the case of the die, well, you had three events that were favorable, right? Three, one, three, and five. And the number of total is six because your sample space had six many events in it. Okay. So when you have a selection, your sample space often has many different outcomes, and it's kind of hard to count them. And so some of the recipes, your heuristics you follow, uh, we'll go over them. Let me check the time. So one of the things you ask yourself is when you're picking things, do you replace them after selection, right, when you pick one, yes or no? Because if you do that, something changes, and we'll talk about what that change is to help you make that accounting over how many possible events you can have. The other is, do you distinguish duplicates, okay? So let's take a look at that first point, do I replace after selection? And we'll use an example of picking a three by three football team. Now, I'm not trying to make a political statement with this. Um, the slide is a couple years old and stuff has changed between then and now. But let's say you have, how many players are there that you can pick from? The players in the center. You have, not a trick question, you have seven players. So let's say you wanted two teams, team A and B, and you wanted to make a three-on-three -three football uh, game. So you have your seven players, and let's say team A and team B. And let's say that you're going to alternate between the two teams. First, team A is going to pick, and then team B is going to pick. So how many choices does team A have available? They're picking first. Team A picks first and team uh, B will pick second. Now, it doesn't matter which one picks first or second, but I have to have somebody first and somebody second. And you'd maybe flip a coin or something to determine who's gonna pick first. But for this example, I'm just using team A picks first and team B picks second. Uh, so how many choices does team A have? Seven choices. Okay, has seven choices. So let's say team A picks somebody and look at what happened to the number of choices available. When team A picked, you can't say, I want this player, and then not physically remove the player from consideration of the next picker, right? So now how many do we have? I mean, it's on the board. You have six. Okay. So when team B picks, team B has six choices. And it doesn't matter which choice team B makes. They make a choice. And now it's team A's turn again. But when team B made that pick, took one out of six, now the number of players available is reduced by one again. It's now five players. So when the pick goes back to team A, five choices. So team A makes a choice. All right, now there are four players left. Team B picks. It reduces by one again. Now three choices for the next pick. So then team A wants to fill in that third player. It has three possible choices. It picks someone. Now it's team B's turn. Only two choices left. They pick someone. Now. It's not important to this example that there's one person left. It doesn't matter how many people you started with. It's just an example, right? So now you have three on three, and you have your choice, but a bunch of things happen. You made a choice, or you sampled or picked, but each time you made that choice, you took them out of the pool of consideration. You sampled without replacement. You took it out of the bin, looked at them, put them aside. They didn't get replaced. Into, back into consideration, right? So whenever you see the description of a problem and you're trying to enumerate all the possible events, one of the questions you should ask yourself, was this selection, this observation, this pick, if you will, um, done with replacement or without replacement, right? 
And if it's done with replacement, like you saw, each time the next pick occurs or the next observation or sample, uh, the number under consideration is going to be reduced by one. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? No? All right. Make sense? Okay. So here's an example of sampling with replacement. So let's say, you know, you're an artist or what have you, and you want to paint something, and you're going to choose a color palette, right? You're going to draw something in crayon, and you're just trying to select different colors. And in this particular case, maybe it's a digital, you know, system, and you're just trying to select. And so in this case, when you pick a color, you're not removing that color from consideration. You're just making a choice based on what you like, and then just using it. And that's like having a bin of choices. You pick one, you look at it, you write down or use what, your, what that choice selection was, and then you put it back in. And so the next person who's going to pick still has that available uh, for consideration. So that's sampling with replacement. Okay. So you have uh, eight colors, right? And my crayon box growing up had eight. I didn't have 64, so I don't know what butter is versus school bus yellow. It's just yellow to me, but nonetheless, you have eight crayons, and I'm still salty about that, but anyways. Um, so you have uh, a color palette, and you have uh, eight possible colors, and let's say you have palette A that one person's going to construct, and palette B that another person's going to construct. So let's say uh, person A is going to pick first. Um, how many choices does person A have uh, for their first crayon? Has, pardon? Eight. Okay, so let me take this off my ear. I can hardly. All right. Has eight choices. So let's say, yep, eight choices. And let's say uh, palette A, that person chose purple. Now, palette A, when they chose purple, when this person chose purple, they're just making that selection, but they're not removing purple from consideration for the next person. So let me ask you a question. Could palette A choose purple again? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you sample with replacement, that means you can have duplicates. Absolutely, you can have duplicates. All right. So now, palette B is going to choose. How many choices does palette B have for the first choice of crayons? Has, pardon? Eight. Palette B has eight. Absolutely. So palette B uh, selects eight. And it's a total of three crayons. And for this example, um, they're going to be all different colors, but um, it doesn't have to be different colors. Okay. So palette B chooses red, and there are still eight choices because palette B sampled with replacement, right? So palette A has eight choices, again, for the next pick, for the next crayon, the second one. And let's say palette A chooses orange, right? Sample with replacement. There are still eight choices available uh, for the next pick. So palette B has eight choices, picks one of them, picks purple. Ah, all right, good choice, purple's nice. Um, and now there are still eight choices because B, for the second crayon, did sampling with replacement. So A chooses yellow, eight choices, B uh, chooses green. Okay. So you'll notice here, between each pick, the number of available choices did not reduce by one, whereas with uh, the three-on-three -three football team, the number of choices reduced by one. Okay? That's a really important point to remember when you're trying to enumerate all the possible, in this case, palettes, uh, color palettes that you can form. Um, so if it's three crayons, eight choices times eight choices times eight choices is eight cubed. Uh, and then the number that B can pick is eight choices times eight choices times eight choices, which is eight cubed. Okay? You multiply them together, that's the combination of two people making palettes, sampling with replacement. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does it make sense? Yes? Okay. So the other big point of, let me, okay, I already said that. With replacement, the sample item is replaced back to the initial set so that the next pick or observation has full consideration. Without replacement, the sampled item or selected item is removed from further consideration, uh, so the number of possibilities is reduced by one. Okay. So the next consideration is do you distinguish duplicates, right? So if you have a set, and a set does not respect ordering, it's just a collection of objects. If you have more than one of them in that collection, uh, do you re represent the fact that duplicates uh, can exist? 
right? And I'll explain what I mean by that. So here's a framing example, and this is in the book. And, you know, the first cut at this is incorrect. And then we'll fix this up uh, with the correct way of thinking about this problem. So let's say a family is planning to have two children. And someone might want to ask, maybe your geneticist or what have you, what is the probability of having two girls, right? Okay. Well, there are three different possibilities for having two children. You could have two girls, you could have two boys, or you could have a girl and a boy. So naively, you might think, gosh, well, there are three of them, and they're all equally likely, or are they? Um, so I'm going to say the probability of having two girls is one third. And if you did that, uh, you'd be wrong. Okay. And so the key consideration here, and it's a little bit nuanced, is whether or not you include the duplicates. And the duplicate here is this case, you have a girl and a boy. Because you could have the girl first and the boy second, or you could have the boy first and the girl second. So there's a duplicate there. If you do not distinguish duplicates, then maybe this one third is correct. If you do distinguish duplicates, which most people do, then this one third is not correct. Okay? So one of the things to ask yourself when you're dealing with counting or enumerating outcomes or observations is, are duplicates distinguishable? Because it changes the problem dramatically. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? All right. So let's take a look at the same problem, and let's um, define our sample space omega, and that's going to be omega gender. And it has two possibilities, female uh, or male. And let's assume that each outcome is equally likely, right? And each birth is independent. What you have for one birth event does not influence the other birth event, right? Okay. So if this is the case, you have female, female. That's one event, two girls. Male, male, two boys. Female followed by male, right? That's the girl who's born first. Or uh, male followed by female, right? Even in identical twins or fraternal twins, somebody has to be born first, right? They don't come out at the same time, right? So if you thought about that edge case, somebody's first, even if it's by like a minute or a few seconds. Okay, so the probability of two girls is the probability of female and female, that event. And so there are two of them, and they're independent, so we can multiply their probabilities together, applying that rule. So we have the probability of female times the probability of female. Well, here, they're equally likely. So each one, if we have omega 1 and omega 2, each one is 1 over the number of omegas, or 1 over 2, right? Uh, so we have 1 half times 1 half, which is 1 quarter. And that's our answer, OK? Any questions about this? Does that make sense? OK, so this example is in the book. Please make sure you're staying up uh, with the reading. OK, so let's continue. If you define the sample space more clearly, you can kind of see this. So let's call it omega-2 children instead of just omega gender. So omega-2 children has four events. There's the female female. There's the male male. There's female born first, and there's male born first, okay? So we see that there are four events. So now it's a lot more clear if you expand out the definition, right? Instead of just gender, the two children uh, sample space, it's a lot clearer to see that the probability of having two girls, each one of these events being equiprobable, is one out of four, okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah? All right. So we have this idea of, is it distinguishable, right? Distinguishable means that order matters. In that case, if your events are distinguishable, that means the event of having the male child first followed by the female is not the same as female born first, uh, male born second. They're not the same if they're distinguishable. If they're indistinguishable, that means the order doesn't matter. Just looking at the presence of, but not the order. Right? Uh, in that case, if it's indistinguishable, the problem, that means male female and female male are the same. You're just looking at the identity, but not the order. Now, this is it distinguishable, these duplicates, and they're called duplicates because, from a set perspective, 
sets don't really have orders uh, of things, right? Are you distinguishing uh, the different ways that you can get male and female? Okay. Uh, any questions? That makes sense. So these are just questions you ask yourself when you see a problem and you're trying to figure out how big your sample space is. Do I replace after after selection? Uh, do I distinguish uh, duplicates? Okay. All right. So with replacement says every sampled item is replaced back to the initial set. If it's random, that means everything has equal probability. You select or count rather the number of events possible or outcomes you can observe and one over that number, one over n, um, is the probability of an individual. Objects can be selected more than once when you sample with replacement because you're putting it back into consideration like the crayon color palette example you can absolutely have purple selected twice if you're choosing three crayons. Why you would is completely up to you, right? All right. All right. So any questions? Make sense? All right. So let's go to this idea of having multiple events uh, that you can have in some arrangement. You have event one, event two, event three. You can order it that way. Event one, event three, event two, event three, event two, event one. And let's say we have a bunch of cards, right? And this is kind of getting to the whole poker thing. And I'm not going to pick up the whole deck, but let's say you have a bunch of cards. And like in poker, right, you get five cards dealt to you, right? So if I were to deal out five cards, at the end of the semester, you're going to be able to compute these probabilities yourself in your head. And so we have 52 cards in a full deck. And one question you might want to ask is how many ways can you select k cards, in this case k is 5, how many hands you can have from a single deck. Now if you know the dealer has two decks and deals out five cards, you can absolutely uh, calculate how many different five card arrangements you can have out of two decks. It's not hard to do, right? Okay, so this is called a permutation. How many different ways you can permute or arrange objects selected out of something. So you have n objects, and in the case of a deck of cards, it's 52 is n, and you're selecting k of them. In the case of a poker hand, it's five cards. So you have a selection from a full deck. Now, one of the ways you might do this arrangement is you could do it with replacement or without replacement. Now, certainly in poker, you don't do it with replacement. Once you get, once you get the card, it's yours. But the general idea of having a permutation, the question you should ask yourself is, is it permutation, an arrangement with replacement, meaning that when you see it, you put it back into the pool of consideration, or without replacement, do you keep it, like was what happens uh, in a poker game? Okay. So let's take a look at permutation with replacement. So of course, we have n many cards in the deck, and n is 52 and you're going to select five of them, k selections. So each time you select a card, if you're just, or I shouldn't say card because it sounds weird, right? That's not how you do a poker game. Let's say crayons. Each time you select a crayon, you're just recording the color and you're putting the crayon back into consideration uh, by the next person. And so in that case, if you have n total things from which you're selecting, you have n choices for that first pick. So this is the first pick. Now the next pick, because you did that replacement, you also have n. That's the second pick. And then the third pick. And then the kth pick, you do that k many times because you're making k, an arrangement of k things. That kth pick also has n choices. So you have n choices times n choices times n choices k many times. And that's n to the, um, n to the k power. Okay? Does that make sense? And that's the case of permutation with replacement. So one of the questions you could be asked, how many ways can you make a color palette of three given a crayon box of eight, right? So you'd have eight times eight times eight. It doesn't matter if you have purple, purple, purple. It doesn't matter if you have unique colors among the three. What matters is that you can arrange them uh, in some order and that order is based on choices, but the choice each time uh, is with replacement. Okay? Any questions about this? 
All right. So let's take a look at permutation without replacement. How many arrangements, and this is closer to what poker is. This is what poker is. So let's say n is 52 for 52 cards. And you're going to get k of them. And poker, k is 5, but we're just going to say k more generally. So the first pick you get, you have, first pick, a total of n objects you can pick from. Right? OK. Once you pick it, like you get you know, a card uh, from a deck, you put it in your hand. And now the next person that picks a card no longer has that card available. You don't know what the identity of this card is. You don't really care at this juncture. But the key part is that it was without replacement, meaning that it was removed from consideration. So the next pick that's made, instead of have n, having n objects available, it has n minus 1 objects available. right? And then the next pick has n minus 2 objects available. So each time you make a pick without replacement, a selection, or observation, if you will, that number of objects or choices you have reduces by 1, right? So now you have n, n minus 1, n minus 2, and on that kth one, you have n minus k plus 1 uh, left. If you don't believe this is true, try it out. I promise you it's correct. Okay. Now, another way mathematically of expressing this is n factorial over n minus k quantity factorial. And to refresh your memory about what factorial means, if you have some integer or some uh, positive uh, integer, or I should say natural, zero, and all the positive whole numbers, and a, and you take the factorial of that, that's a times a minus 1 times a minus 2, all the way up through uh, multiplying by 1, right? Uh, so this expression that we have here, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 times n minus k plus 1, is the same as saying n factorial over n minus k factorial. And let me write over here so my penmanship is a little bit neater. If we were to expand this expression to prove it to you, well, n factorial, we have a definition down here for what factorial is. That's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 times n minus k plus 1. And let me ask you, what is 1 less than n minus k plus 1? It's, pardon? n minus k. So 1 less than n minus k plus 1 times n minus k times n minus k minus 1. And then eventually you get to times 2. <laughs> that does not read times 1. OK. So if we have all of that in the numerator, and this is an abuse of notation, and n minus k factorial is n minus k times n minus k minus 1 dot 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 times 2 times 1. OK. So we look at this expression, and wait a minute. I notice something here. Well, I have n factorial, but at some point when I have n factorial along the way, I have n minus k times n minus k minus 1, blah, 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 times 2 times 1. Well, here's n minus k times n minus k minus 1 blah, 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 times 2 times 1. I have the same thing here going to the right as what's in the denominator. OK, so this cancels, this cancels. Everything here cancels with this part. That goes to 1. OK, so what I'm left with is the same expression here that we started with. n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot, 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 times n minus k plus 1. OK? So these are equivalent expressions, and this is permutation with replacement. It's the number of arrangements you can have when you pick and remove that pick from consideration, from further consideration. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. So all right, we have about four minutes. Um, let me introduce this next uh, concept, okay, with five minutes, uh, and see if we can get through it. If not, we'll just pick up with that on Tuesday. So what about the indistinguishable case? In this case, permutation, it was um, distinguishable, right? So if you picked uh, blue and green, or, you know, the individual identities matter, right? Just like female, male, male, female. Now let's take a look at the case where you have the same idea, 
of making an arrangement of k things from a pool of n many things. But in this case, uh, the arrangements are indistinguishable. So if you pick female, male, that's not distinguishable from male, female, right? You're looking at the identity, but not the order in which you pick them. So that's called combination. The first one is called permutation. And the second one is, call, is called combination. And when you write combination, there are different ways of writing it. You can write C of n comma k. So that's the combination of k things arranged out of n. So that means the indistinguishable arrangement of k many things drawn from a pool of n. And another way of writing it is this n choose k, as it's called. Right? You have this parentheses, and then n is a number of objects, and k is a number of things in that arrangement. And so if you were to expand out the definition for what combination is, well, it's n factorial over n minus k factorial, and then you have 1 over k factorial. And if you look back, well, it looks similar to permutation. Permutation was n factorial over n minus k quantity factorial. But here, we have this extra term, that k factorial, right? So let's think about why that k factorial is there. And it's that k factorial, its role is to account for the fact that you can arrange those k many things you've picked into a number of uh, arrangements. So let's say you have a population of 1,000 women and 800 men. And you might ask, how many soccer teams can I form consisting of six women and five men? Now, in this case, you don't care if it's Mary, if it's Sue, or whatever, who it is, or if it's Bob or Joe, right? You don't care about the particular male, particular female. So it's indistinguishable in terms of the identity of the person. So here, if you talked about permutation, you'd say, how many ways can we pick six out of a thousand? Because the pool of women in this example is a thousand many, and we're going to try to find an arrangement of six. And likewise for men, out of 800, we're going to find an arrangement of five. So the problem is, and if we were to write this out, we'd have six of these Ws for six women, and we have five of these Ms corresponding to slots uh, for five men out of the 800. Now, of course, you can pick the same two males and have them in different order. Bob is chosen first, and then Joe is chosen second. Or you could have Joe is chosen first, and Bob is chosen second, right? That is two different ways of saying the same thing if you're dealing with indistinguishable arrangements. So here are our group of women. And let's say you have six of these women that you've picked out of the 1,000. Now, there are six factorial different ways you can arrange these women, right? You could have, and I'm trying to think of like six uh, female names, but let's just say uh, uh, female one, two, three, four, five, and six. You could have it in that order. You could have it in female 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, and 6. And so you can think of all of the same group of women that you pick. You can think of arranging them, and the number of arrangements for those six is going to be 6 factorial. right? And the reason why it's 6 factorial, because you pick the first woman, there are 6 choices. The second one, out of the 6, 5 choices, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's why you get that 6 factorial. Okay? So in your definition, you have a permutation, but you need to divide out the duplicates. And that dividing of the duplicates is where this denominator over k factorial comes from. So in the case of this example, you divide by 6 factorial to account for the fact that this group of six women can be arranged 6 factorially many ways. OK? All right. So we'll end there, and we'll pick back up with this on Tuesday. Um, I will see you then.